Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time. At First Baptist Church of Central City, we would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you have your Bibles, open them to Proverbs chapter 3. We're in verses 9 and 10. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, a personal copy that you can open up at home and read and study through, please let me know before leaving today, and we will get you a copy of God's Word to take home with you. But we are in Proverbs. We've been in a brief series in Proverbs, and the book of Proverbs is all about wisdom. Uh, we started our year in Proverbs because we want to make wise choices. We want to make the right decisions, not just for 2019, but throughout the course of our entire lives. Uh, so we've been in a very familiar passage, a very well-known passage, but I encourage you to read through the entire book on your own. If you want to get wisdom, you can find wisdom in Proverbs. Uh, again, we've been in a very familiar passage, and what we've covered so far is this. How do we live wisely and make the right choices, and what is the benefit of wise living? Today we are asking another question. It's a question that many people wonder about, at least they wonder about the answer to the question, and that is how can we live wisely in regard to our finances? How can we live wisely in regard to our finances? Now keep in mind, I usually have, give or take, about 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. Uh, we recently offered a financial peace class that met for 10 weeks, and that's something we plan to do again in the future. Uh, gave some really good details there, really good planning strategies. We don't really have a lot of time in a Sunday morning sermon to talk about budgeting and ways to earn and good strategies for saving up. Uh, but if you will heed the one principle that Proverbs emphasizes today, if you will live by this principle we're going to talk about today, you will find that everything else will fall into place. So let's get into it this morning. How can we be wise with our finances? Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, the word we are hearing today is not mine, but yours. And so we pray, Father, that you would stir our hearts and that you would be here in this place today by your Holy Spirit. God, we pray that you would give us ears to hear your word and to live by it. Lord, to honor your word and to honor you with our lives. God, we ask that you would affect us today. Lord, that you would stir in our hearts and that you would move us toward Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God, that you would change us and change our hearts to be focused toward you, that our lives would be lived for you. And God, we pray that you would use this time for your glory. We thank you for bringing us here safely, Lord. We thank you uh, for the wonderful praise that we've been able to lift up today, and we look forward to continuing to lift up praise to you. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You know, there's an old expression that many of us use, many of us are familiar with, and that is that someone or something is worth its weight in gold. Someone or something is worth its weight in gold. And basically what that means is that you couldn't see yourself living without whatever this is. It's to say that something is extremely valuable, and it's an expression that we still use. You'll hear it quite often, although heaviness isn't really we something we think of a lot in terms of value measurement today. Right Nowadays, we tend to think in terms of dollar amount or price or how long something can last or how much personal significance something has. But at the root of our economy, understand we still rely on precious metals, specifically gold, and the amount of those precious metals that we have in weight. 
right? The amount that we have in weight. Uh, likewise, a diamond is much more valuable the heavier the carat of the diamond is. And a final example, just to make sure you've got this down, for those of you who have seen the Back to the Future movies, anytime there's something important going on, anytime there's something of great value, Marty McFly always looks to Doc and he says, Doc, that's, anybody? One person, two people? Have you seen Back to the Future? Raise your hands if you've seen Back to the Future. Somebody. Okay, he says, Doc, that's heavy. That's heavy, Doc. Whoa, this is really heavy. In fact, you remember the scene where he's back in the past and Doc finally looks at him. He says, there's that word again, heavy. What's wrong in the future? Is there something wrong with the Earth's gravitational pull? Right? He, he can't understand what Marty means, that something is heavy. Now, that's all a little bit silly, so why exactly are we talking about things being heavy? Verse 9 of our passage reads like this. It says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. And the root of that Hebrew word that is translated as honor is to be heavy. Okay, that's the root of the word, to be heavy. In other words, to honor someone is to esteem them as having value. It's to declare that someone has social weight and social prominence. And the wisdom of Proverbs here tells us that we should honor the Lord, we should declare the weightiness of God. And here we are told to honor God, to declare his value to the world, not just in the things that we say, not just in the songs that we sing, not just on the posts that we put on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, but from our wealth. Some of you all are familiar with Dr. Gary Chapman's concept of the five love languages. Dr. Chapman argues that every person has a particular love language that they receive love from. And it's important that you know that about your spouse, what their love language is. And he says that all people need love communicated to them in these five love languages, these five ways. Words of affirmation, physical touch or body language, receiving gifts, quality time, and acts of service. And understand, if it's important that we show people this love through these different love languages, then likewise, it is infinitely more important that we show God how worthy He is by expressing our love of Him in these five ways as well. So understand, that includes us giving of our finances. And the big question that many people ask at that point, and you may be asking that question this morning, is very simply, why? Why? Why on earth would God want my money? Why on earth would God need my money? Why would God need anything? And just so we are crystal clear today, understand God doesn't need anything. There is nothing that you have that God needs that he hopes you will help him to obtain. Acts chapter 17 verses 24 and 25 say this, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Again, God doesn't need anything from us. But we are called to honor God with our money because we have to recognize that money, even though it is absolutely nothing but a material resource, can very quickly become our God. It's very easy for money to become an idol in our lives when we begin to trust money. When we begin to find security in it and to put our confidence in it. When we begin to rely on it as our source of safety and strength and status. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. But too often, brothers and sisters, we hear that. We hear that the love of money is the root of all evil. And we think, well, obviously, that's not me. Okay, that's not where I am. I don't love money. I just realistically rely on money. 
And, and this is where we have to understand that when the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil, it's not talking about people sending Valentine's Day cards down to Fort Knox. Okay, it's not talking about pulling green bills out of your pocket and kissing them goodnight. It's not talking about Scrooge McDuck kind of swimming through all the gold coins in that big room and just so in love with his money. It's talking about when we begin to believe that money can save us or money can help us or money can keep us alive for a little bit longer than we were intended to or money can make us happy. Too often, brothers and sisters, it's talking about you and me. Money can hold a power over us. And the quickest way to break the power of money over us is simply to give it away. And who better to give it to than the one who gave it to you? We have to remember, and we've said this before, but it is so easy to forget and it's so easy to live as if this isn't true. But apart from God, we have nothing at all. We have earned nothing apart from God. And someone says, don't tell me that. I've worked hard for every penny I've ever made. I'm a self-made man. Brother, you better check yourself. Because we have to remember that God is the one who has put breath in our lungs. God's the one who gave us the intelligence we had. He gave us the physical strength that we had. He's the one that it was his will that we be born here. As opposed to a third world country where you could have worked 10 times as hard as you have in your lifetime. And earned about 10,000 times less. Honor the Lord from your wealth. Now again, the scripture here says, verse 9, Honor the Lord from your wealth. And from the first of all your produce. Pastor Tim Keller uh, has told the story before that there was a farmer who came in and he told his pastor, he said, Pastor, I've been blessed. Uh, the Lord has shown me grace. My cow gave birth to two calves unexpectedly. Wasn't expecting it at all. And uh, when I sell those two calves that the Lord's given to me, I'm going to give the proceeds of one of those to the church. A few weeks later, he came back in and he saw the pastor and he said, Reverend, I'm sorry, but the Lord's calf died. <laughs> Folks, very often in our lives, it's the Lord's calf that dies. When we don't give from our first fruits, understand something inevitably comes up, something that we have to pay for, something we feel like we must buy, and pretty soon we don't have what's left that's supposed to be for the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, God's people were commanded to give of the first fruits of their crops. In other words, they gave the very best of the harvest and the very first portion of the harvest to the Lord, not having any idea how big the harvest for that year was going to be. In other words, they had a plan for their giving. And that was when they got their paychecks, they were going to give God His first. And when you live like that, that can put you in a bind. But you know what that did in their hearts? That caused them to begin to trust, not in the harvest, but in the Lord of the harvest. In the one who has made everything, in the one who has made you and I, and the one who's promised to care for us. Their trust in their hearts was in the Lord. But can you say the same thing about your heart today? The answer is often found in what we do with our money. Now someone would ask, well, what is God going to do for me? What reason would I have to trust in the Lord? Again, in verse 9, we see not only are we given instruction for honoring God with our finances, but then in verse 10, we're told this, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats or your presses will overflow with new wine. Now as a joke, a good friend of mine in this church, mind you, I may give you his address sometime if you're looking for a house to toilet paper, uh, but he signed me up for a uh, list that I'm on of phone calls and mail outs from a charlatan named Peter Popoff. We got a picture of him, I believe. Uh, this guy is a, is a false prophet. Uh, he claims to be a prophet. He's been outed many, many times as a fraud, 
Uh, currently, he owns a $4.7 million home in Bradbury, California, and he drives a Porsche as well as a Mercedes-Benz. Uh, again, I get mail outs from him thanks to someone who I tempted to name, but, uh, you know, maybe another time I will name him. I just found him under the bus, so you all can maybe sign him up for things. But I get these phone calls from Peter Popoff, and I let it go to voicemail, and when I check it, it always begins, This is your prophet, Peter Popoff. Please don't hang up. Always starts that way, to which I cut it off. But I also get some miracle water in the mail and some cloths and these kind of things that if I'll put them underneath my, my pillow at night and if I'll pray to Peter Popoff, I guess, and send him some money, then, buddy, I'm going to be in a, in a windfall. Uh, so you all forgive me for not having that money to share around, but I just don't trust Peter Popoff. Uh, ultimately, he's a false teacher. He peddles what is called the prosperity gospel, which is basically preying upon people for their money. Now, when we read a verse like verse 10, someone like Peter Popoff there, he would say that this is proof that if you just have enough faith, specifically demonstrated by giving Peter Popoff, someone like him, your money, then God will bless you more than you could possibly begin to imagine. He would say, would you like to be rich? then just give in faith to my ministry and you can sow a seed of being rich. Now I want to hear from you all this morning. Is that how we should read Proverbs 3.10? No, no, of course not. We don't read it that way. Proverbs 3.10 is a promise from God's word, but the promise is not that you will become rich by giving some so-called ministry where the only work being done is a heretic begging for money, your money. Okay? The promise is that people who are faithful to God with what they have will be given more to be faithful with. Okay, Matthew Henry, making the same point in his commentary on this verse, wrote this, quote, He does not say your bags, but your barns. Not your wardrobe replenished, but your presses. God will bless you with an increase of that which is for use, not for show or ornament. For spending and laying out, not for hoarding and laying up. End quote. To give our tithes and offerings to the Lord not only reorients our hearts toward God, but it also causes us to have more to give back to Him. Because in true ministry, the work of the Lord is being carried out. And therefore, God provides for those who give to the work of his ministry, who give to the work of his kingdom. And so we started this morning asking the question, how can we be wise with our finances? And I said that if you'll live by this principle of honoring the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your earnings, everything else will fall into place. How exactly does that work? Okay, well, first, we've already seen that God has specifically promised to provide an abundance for those who honor him from their wealth so that he might be honored even more. But I think it's important that we go back to that issue of our hearts, the issue of the heart. You see, financial health comes down to good financial choices. That's what's talked about in that financial piece university class. And when your heart is oriented toward God and you've submitted not just your money to him, but you've submitted your whole self over to the Lord, you don't make frivolous spending choices. You don't throw your money away on things you don't need. Now, I don't know about any of your all's Netflix history, but you don't need Marie Kondo to come in and pray to your home and pray to the stuff to tell you that you've bought a lot of junk. Right? That's what we do. I mean, sadly, as Americans, that is what we do. But the sad thing, the sadder thing is things that we don't need often become things that we think we do need when we don't have our hearts faced and oriented toward the Lord. How many of you have a cell phone? Take it out. Hold it up. Go ahead. I know we got a lot more cell phones than that in the sanctuary. One of us bound to go off before I'm done. Hold them up. Hold them up high. 
Yeah. I got a newsflash for you about that thing, about the thing I'm holding. We don't need these. You understand? We don't actually need these things. Now, they're very handy, right? And they help us to do a lot of work, and they help us to keep up. But here's the key. The world has been spinning, and people have been efficient and getting a lot of work done and keeping up with everybody that they know for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years without cell phones. That's right. But you know, we have still encountered people who have no money for food, no money to pay their bills, who are looking for help who have a nicer cell phone than I have. Folks, the priorities aren't lined up. When we love money and when we love material things, we become enslaved to spending more and more of it. We become enslaved to this rat race, as we call it, where the only thing we are living for is that next big thing, whether it's that big car or it's that big house or it's that video game system or it's that movie trip or whatever it might be. We have that in mind and we keep going toward that. And once we get it, we're satisfied for a little bit, right? I mean, ultimately, it's that thrill of buying something new. But then it goes away. And then it sits. And then we move to the next thing. And when we continue living like that, we're not just broken people. Pretty soon we're going to be broke people. But when we turn our hearts toward God, we find ourselves in better financial health because we don't spend our money on things we don't need. In fact, we give away more to where it should go. And find ourselves still lacking nothing thanks to the faithfulness and goodness of the Lord. And so here's my last question for you this morning. Then I'm going to close. How much does God weigh to you? How much does God weigh? I don't know if you can see the picture we have on the screen. Uh, it's a picture of a woman who is on her hands and knees and she's kissing a rock and other people have kissed this rock and touched this rock and uh, if you're like me you may be looking and thinking how many germs are on that thing right a little bit a little bit nervous so, so what's this woman's problem I mean, does she know that the flu is around right well, what's happening here let's just be blunt is she just a dumb person for getting down and kissing something like that that picture uh, I actually took myself a couple weeks ago when we were in Israel uh, at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher uh, where we find the spot they believe that Jesus was uh, crucified and where he died and where he was entombed. Uh, and that stone there is the anointing stone. Uh, and it's believed that that was the stone uh, that the body of our Lord and Savior was laid upon as Joseph of Arimathea prepared it for burial. Okay, so, so understand here, what you see when you go to this place are people of all different ages, people of different ethnicities, different nations, who follow Jesus, coming up, some of them very frail, some of them, it's not easy for them to get around. And folks, just to demonstrate the point, I want you to see me, they get down on their hands and knees and they kiss that stone. They kiss it. Now, they're not worshiping the stone. They don't believe that something magical is going to happen or that by doing that, all of a sudden, they're going to hop up and they're going to be in good health and they're going to have a check in the mail from Peter Popoff. No, they get down because they believe that that is the place where their Lord and Savior, after he suffered and bled and died at the hands of sinful men was laid and prepared to be buried. And they want to be where he was. They want to participate in what he felt. And they just want to kiss that stone so that they can pray and say, Lord, thank you. So understand, 
For that woman in that picture, God's pretty heavy. He's heavy enough that he has weighed her down to her hands and knees to kiss that stone. And so I would ask you this morning, how much does God weigh to you? How much does he weigh? How much do you value him? You say, well, I know how much I value him. I value him in my heart. What does that even mean? I mean, is that real life? Are you following Jesus? Are you living for Jesus, the one who called us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him? Or do you just kind of think about him every now and then? Maybe you come to church every Sunday or so and give him a little lip service. Folks, I know we're talking specifically about our finances this morning, but it's about a lot more than our finances. The question is, does God mean anything to you? Does it mean anything to you that he came down in the person of Jesus Christ and died for our sins? And he didn't stay there. See, he didn't go from that stone into the tomb and then you can go visit the tomb. I didn't get to go see where the body of Jesus was. You know why? It's not there. It's not there. He rose from the dead and he ascended to his throne on high where he reigns over the world. And he still saves people like that woman. He still saves people like you and me. He saves people that don't deserve it. People who have had second chance after third chance after fourth chance. He still saves. Because his blood is still sufficient to cover the cost of our sins. Folks, he is worth infinitely more than we could ever give to him. But I would ask you again, how heavy is he to you? How much are you honoring him with your life? Would you pray with me?